In today's lecture, the first in our series about bacterial genera, we're going to be talking about Staphylococcus. This is a genus that we know a lot about. Organisms within this genus are very important human and veterinary pathogens. Staphylococci are gram-positive cocci, like you can see from here up in the cartoon, and they're aerobic or facultatively anaerobic. So aerobic meaning they can grow in the presence of oxygen, and facultatively anaerobic meaning they have the ability to grow under anaerobic conditions. Staphylococci are frequently described as either coagulase positive or negative. This is an important biochemical differentiation that's really critical to discussing these bacteria. Colonies are generally creamy or white colored on blood agar, and these are all biocontainment level 2 bacteria. Staphylococcus aureus has been with us for a long time. This is a study uh, published back in 2015 from the journal PLOS One, where researchers investigated the gut microbiome of this 11th century Andean mummy. Um, you can see the mummy in picture A here. In picture B, this is some of the paleo feces, so some fecal material that had been preserved. And then in C, you can see the presence of the Trypanosoma cruzii uh, parasite. Interestingly, using metagenomic analysis, they were also able to identify Staphylococcus aureus. This is a gram stain of Staphylococcus aureus, and I think you can really easily appreciate the grape-like clusters of gram-positive cocci. And the name in Greek actually means bunch or cluster of berries, which is kind of what a pure culture looks like uh, microscopically. Staphylococcus aureus is a beta hemolytic species. So on blood agar, you can see clearing of the erythrocytes under and surrounding the colonies. And on this image on the left, you can actually see the secondary zone of hemolysis further out from the colonies. So there's a primary, very bright zone of, of hemolytic activity right under the organisms, and then further out, there's a secondary zone. So Staph aureus is described as having double zone hemolysis. On chromogenic media, here we have Staph aureus growing on chromagar Staph aureus on the left, these nice pink colonies, and mannitol salt agar on the right. This characteristic colony morphology is really useful in the presumptive identification before we've done biochemical tests. Here we have a strain of Staphylococcus epidermidis. On the left, you can see colonies growing on blood agar, and you'll note that it is not hemolytic. And then on the right, we have mannitol salt agar. So while we do have colonies, this organism is halophilic and is able to grow um, in high concentrations of salt, it doesn't ferment mannitol, which helps to differentiate it from other staphylococcal species like Staph aureus and Staph pseudintermedius. In this slide, you can see Staphylococcus pseudintermedius, which is a very, very important organism in companion animal practice. Staph pseudintermedius is morphologically quite similar to Staphylococcus aureus. We have double zone hemolysis, but the colonies are more white or gray as compared to Staph aureus, which tends to be a little bit more creamy or yellow colored. I mentioned that Staph are oftentimes described as coagulase positive or negative. And on this right-hand panel here, you can see uh, several tubes with the coagulase test. In these tubes, we have some rabbit plasma to which we add a small uh, portion of a colony and then incubate that uh, at 37 degrees. After incubation, we gently invert the tubes and see if we have any formation of a stable clot. On the left and in the middle here, you can see that when rotated, the uh, plasma flows along the side of the tube with gravity. In the case of Staph aureus on the right, you can see we have the formation of a stable clot and that that uh, plasma does not flow. The image on the right is a DNA's agar plate, which is a biochemical test um, that allows us to detect the presence of diffusible uh, DNases, or enzymes that break down DNA. Staph aureus is DNA positive, as indicated by this zone of clearings surrounding the culture, while Staph epidermidis is DNA negative. By and large, Staphylococci are host-associated organisms. They're considered part of the normal microbiota, um, particularly of the skin, mucous membranes, and intestinal tract. 
we see different staphylococcal species associated with different hosts. So 30% of us, 30% of people are colonized with staph aureus, either in our nose, our pharynx, or intestinal tract. In the canine world, about 90% of dogs are colonized with staph pseudintermedius. While these organisms are primarily host associated, we can see environmental contamination playing a role in the epidemiology of uh, hospital acquired or nosocomial infections. So proper cleaning and disinfection can be really important uh, to prevent transmission in, in healthcare settings. Within the genus Staphylococcus, we have 64 species, of which only a few are commonly encountered as causes of infections. I mentioned earlier the coagulase test. This is a very important biochemical differentiation. Oftentimes we think of our coagulase positives as being more virulent. They're more able to cause disease and they're more commonly encountered in animals who aren't severely debilitated. We can then differentiate those coagulase positives based on whether or not they're hemolytic. So Staph hyacus, a common pathogen of pigs, is not hemolytic, while Staph aureus uh, and the intermediate group, which includes intermediate, pseudintermediate, and delphini, are all hemolytic. These can then be further differentiated with either the hyaluronidase or acetoin tests. Coagulase negative staphylococci can be challenging to differentiate biochemically, requiring an extensive panel of tests. And so for this reason, it would be more common to ID these organisms using either MALDI-TOF or preferentially, at least in a research setting, uh, through phylogenetic analysis of a conserved gene like CPN60. Staphylococcus schlepherii is coagulase variable, so some isolates are coagulase positive, some are coagulase negative, and these are also encountered, particularly in companion animal practice. When it comes to virulence factors, we know by far the most about Staph aureus as compared to other species. This is a very important human pathogen, and so it's well studied. Staph aureus produces toxic shock syndrome toxin, TSST, which is a super antigen. Most notably, toxic shock syndrome toxin producing Staph aureus were associated with using certain types of tampons uh, in the 1980s and 90s. Some strains of Staphylococcus aureus also produce enterotoxins. These are responsible for food poisoning. This is the foodborne illness that we see uh, shortly after consuming uh, a food product, so kind of one to two hours. It's important to differentiate this food poisoning from foodborne infections, as Staph aureus food poisoning is actually an intoxication and doesn't require the presence of replicating organisms in the gut to cause disease. In the pathogenesis of food poisoning, we have actively replicating Staph aureus in typically creamy type foods, potato salads, mayonnaise, custards, puddings, things like that. And in that food, it's producing toxins. These toxins are heat stable. So even if that food is heated up and cooked and all of the organisms killed off, that toxin remains and is able to cause illness when subsequently ingested. Preventing contamination of foods through good hand hygiene is a critical first step, but it's also important to keep cold foods cold so that any contaminating Staph aureus isn't able to grow. A variety of staphs produce exfoliations, which cause skin damage and result in a scalded skin appearance. Also a variety of toxins, which are active against white blood cells, so various leukocidins, such as the Panton Valentine leukocidin, which destroys human white blood cells. Staphs also produce the M scrams, so these uh, surface components that are able to recognize and adhere to host tissues and structures, really important in that association uh, step of, of causing disease. They produce catalase, which allows them to resist hydrogen peroxide. You can imagine this might be important in surviving the oxidative burst within our white blood cells. And then hyaluronidase, which in addition to being a biochemical test, is a degradative enzyme that facilitates spread of the staphylococci into contiguous tissues. We see a variety of clinical diseases associated with staph in both people and animals. Staph aureus is frequently encountered as a cause of mastitis or mammary tract infections in cattle, small ruminants, pigs, and horses. We see bumblefoot in poultry. 
And then in dogs and cats, we see opportunistic and skin infections. So whenever the organism gains access to a sterile site, it will happily cause an infection. In dogs and cats, we see a similar thing with both Staph pseudintermedius and Staph schlepherii, happily causing these opportunistic and skin infections. In pigs, Staphylococcus hyacus causes exudative epidermitis or greasy pig disease. And then the coagulase negative species, Staph chromogenes, causes mastitis in cattle and small ruminants. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into the most important clinical syndromes, starting with Staph aureus mastitis. Staph aureus can colonize the udder of, of cattle, meaning that those colonized animals can serve as a reservoir for the rest of a farm. Staph adheres to and invades the mammary epithelium and can be really challenging to treat when it forms small colony variants and L forms, which are metabolically less active, physiologically somewhat abnormal organisms. On the bottom right here, you can see an example of some small colony variants, these very, very tiny colonies. Um, because they're growing abnormally and they're not replicating to the same extent that a normal Staph aureus would, they're less susceptible to antibiotics. Staph aureus mastitis can present as either a per-acute disease, which is rapidly progressive, or subacute, which is where we may not have any overt clinical signs, but where you may have decreased milk production. In these cases, uh, it's a major economic problem. So this chronic subclinical disease results in decreased production plus sporadic uh, per acute cases. It's very expensive for the farmer, both in terms of lost milk yield and also dealing with clinical cases in, in the herd. In this image, you can see a cytological preparation of bovine milk from an animal affected by Staph aureus mastitis. And I think you can appreciate these little Staph aureus organisms throughout the field. Although our Staphylococcus is pink in this image, it's important to know that cytology is not done using the gram stain. And we therefore can't rely upon uh, the color of the organisms to tell us whether they're gram positive or negative. A separate preparation would need to be done. Because Staph aureus is able to colonize cattle, uh, improved hygiene is really important for control of the spread of the organism. Disinfecting milking equipment, and not milking the infected quarter are really important management strategies. For chronically infected animals, culling those Staph aureus carriers is certainly possible, and in some cases, intramammary antibiotics are also used. Although for Staphylococci in general, we really need to be aware of antimicrobial resistance, and in the case of Staph aureus, methicillin, is, methicillin resistance is very problematic. MRSA, or any methicillin-resistant staph species is resistant to all beta-lactam therapies, so cefepirin, ceftiafir, or cloxacillin, which may be commonly used in agricultural practice. 